Hello, grade sixes. Happy Friday. Woohoo! It's the weekend and some camping going on. I know I heard the kids telling me. And hopefully, you all have something fun to do this weekend. Here's today's installment of BFG. Hopefully, everyone is listening because I will have some questions at the end here. And we are getting pretty darn close to finding out how this ends. This chapter is called The Royal Breakfast. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants when orders were received from the queen that a 24-foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom with the next half, within the next half an hour. The butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in the short time available. A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, sagacity, discretion, and a host of other talents that neither you nor I possess. Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry, sipping an early morning glass of light ale, when the order reached him. In a split second, he had made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man requires a three-foot high table to eat off of, a 24-foot giant will require a 12-foot high table. And if a six-foot man requires a chair with a two-foot high seat, a 24-foot giant will require a chair with an eight-foot high seat. Everything, Mr. Tibbs told himself, must be multiplied by four. Two breakfast eggs must become eight. Four rashers of bacon must become 16. Three pieces of toast must become 12, and so on. These calculations about food were immediately passed on to Monsieur Papillon, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the ballroom. Butlers don't walk. They skim over the ground, followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen all wore knee breeches, and every one of them displayed beautifully rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you become, can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned ankle. It is the first thing they look at when you are interviewed. Push the grand piano into the center of the room, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Butlers never raised their voices above the softest whisper. Four footmen moved the piano. Now fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three other footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of drawers and placed it on top of the piano. That will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It is exactly eight feet off the ground. Now we shall make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort. Fetch me four very tall grandfather clocks. There are plenty of them around the palace. Let each clock be 12 feet high. 16 footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not easy to carry and required four footmen to each one. Place the four clocks in the rectangle eight feet by four alongside the grand piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footman did so. Now, fetch me the young prince's ping-pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The ping-pong table was carried in. Unscrew its legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now place the ping-pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks. Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on step ladders. Mr. Tibbs stood back to survey the new furniture. Nothing of it is in the classic, classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave orders that a damask tablecloth should be draped over the ping-pong table. 
and in the end it looked really quite elegant after all. Here's a picture of them hauling in the grandfather clock. So those are your uh, footmen. So remember they said that they wore knee-length breeches. Um, where are we? At this point, Mr. Tibbs was seen to hesitate. The footmen all stared at him, aghast. Butlers never hesitate. Not even when they are faced with the most impossible problems. It is their job to be totally decisive at all times. Knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibb was heard to mutter. Our cutlery will be like little pins in his hands. But Mr. Tibbs didn't hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new unused garden fork and also a spade. And for a knife, we shall use the great sword hanging on the wall in the morning room. But clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles I. And there may still be a little dried blood on the blade. Ooh, yuck. When all of this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler eyes over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a coffee cup for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find in the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the great sword. So much for the giant. Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small delicate table and two chairs alongside the giant's table. This was for the queen and for Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and chair towered far above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All these arrangements were only just completed when the queen, now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie. And to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked up a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and had pinned it on the left side of Sophie's chest. That is where we will leave off today, guys and ladies. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And if you have a chance, send me a picture from your weekend. I'd love to see what you're up to. Don't work too hard. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> There's Marla.